Okay, so we are now going to start with our discussion on optimization, uh, which is what we are here to learn. Um, so, uh, local and global minimum. So the, so the the first thing we are going to do is uh, we'll talk about um, the definitions of what does it mean for a point to be a local minimum or for it to be a global minimum. So let's say I want to solve this problem, minimize fx such that x is in some set x, and x is a subset of Rn, and f is a function from x to R. Okay, so so if x is uh, so if x is equal to R n, then it's called unconstrained optimization. And if x is a strict subset, subset of Rn, then it's a constrained optimization. So the first uh, few weeks, or maybe uh, first two weeks, we are going to talk about unconstrained optimization. Um, the other thing, okay, what's a local minimum? So x star is local minimum if and only if f x star is less than or equal to f x for all x in x such that norm of x minus x star is less than epsilon. For some epsilon, very small. There exist epsilon greater than zero such that. Okay. So let's look at an example. Uh, and I have some function. Is this visible to the people in the back? No? Okay, let me use something else. Even this is not that dark. This is some function f of x. This is my x. And let's say my interval of interest is this interval. Okay, so it's a constrained optimization problem. And I want to find a local minimum. Uh, so let me. So in this particular case, there are two local minimum. One is this, x1 star, and the other one is this, x2 star, okay? Now, x2 star is a local minimum. This is kind of obvious because it's the lowest point in the, in the entire graph within this interval, within this interval of interest. But even x1 star is actually a local minimum because if you pick a small uh, subset around x1 star, small open set around x1 star, you will notice that x1 star is actually the smallest point. Uh, so, sorry, not x1 star, but fx1 star is the smallest point in this entire curve, the, the lowest point. And that's why it's a local minimum. Where in the local minimum definition you 
wrote Oh, is there the discussion of that open bound around x1 star? Is it in the choice of epsilon? Sorry? Is it in the? Um, oh, you're just saying that it's stable there? OK. Yeah. So x minus x star. So you pick a ball around x star. Mm -hmm. OK, now it's not required that the entire ball will be there in the set x. So you want to make sure that x is in x and you look at the ball around x star intersection with that particular set mm -hmm. and you want to make sure that the function <laughs> achieves a minimum within that restricted set okay so that would be the definition of a local minimum so for instance you could have a sphere intersection with a plane right so it's a circle not a circle but a, it's a it's a disk right a twisted disk and then you want to make sure that you can find uh, an x star which achieves the minimum within that disk. Okay. What did you say? It's a different mentality for epsilon than the convergence bounds because we're using yes, this length yes, and yes, that disk. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's different from the convergence uh, concept. Now the global minimum is defined in a similar manner so global minimum x star is global minimum if and only if f of x star is less than equal to f of x for all x in capital x so you don't have to look at a neighborhood around x star So naturally in this case x2 star is the global minimum whereas x2 star and x1 star both of them are local minimum. Any question? Yes. Why am I using? Oh because I'm looking at constrained optimization. So if you go outside of the set x Yeah, so let's say your, your this capital X is a hyperplane. So your X is X such that AX is equal to B. Okay, so now you are looking at a hyperplane. Your set is a hyperplane in, the, in R3. Uh, and you claim that this point X star is a local minimum then you need to, when you're defining the local minimum, you want to make sure that all the points with which you are comparing should be within the set itself. Otherwise, if you go out of the set, then anything can happen, right? So you have to look at this disk around x star, okay? And you need to compare the values of function within this disk, okay? Now, this disk could be small or it could be big, right? But still have to restrict yourself to that disk. Any other question? Okay, so the, the discussion about, so local minimum, even though you might think that local minimum is, uh, why would someone want to compute a local minimum? And it'll become clear in some, in a few days from now, that in most optimization problems, you can only hope to get to a local minimum, okay? There's no hope of getting to the global minimum unless the function has some very special structure. And not all functions will have that kind of structure, okay? So that's why local minimum is what we hope for in most optimization problems that is solved on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you can define a strict local minimum if fx star is strictly less than fx for all x in x such that these conditions are satisfied and x is not equal to x star. So I want to
so strict local minimum you have the same definition fx star is strictly less than f of x for all x in x x minus x star less than epsilon and x is not equal to x star so you're looking at the disk but you remove the center of the disk out from your consideration and similarly you can define strict global minimum if f of x star is less than f of x for all x in x x not equal to x star yes So, if you define, if you can have x equal to x star, then this inequality will never be satisfied. So, you will never have a strict local minimum or a strict global minimum, right? But you somehow want to distinguish this point and this point from a function that probably looks something like this, right? Where you have a bunch of global minimum, right? A continuum of global minimum, uh, but they're not strict global minimum. Okay. Any other question? Yes. Strict global minimum. No. Fx star is strictly less than Fx. So you want global minimum, right? So this is the global minimum. Yeah, yeah. So for maximum you have to, yeah, you have to have the inequality the other way. Okay, but you can transform all optimization problem in, into this standard uh, looking form. So if you are, want to maximize, then you can take negative of fx and that's the function you want to minimize. Okay, so now we want to talk about necessary conditions for optimality. Uh, what does it mean for a, for a point to be optimal? Okay. And this is something that you might have studied in single dimension, right? When is a point optimal? So now we want to generalize this concept to multiple functions over multiple variables. necessary conditions for optimality okay so how do you write necessary conditions so well if x star is local minimum then then what happens first order necessary condition is gradient of f x star is equal to 0. Second order necessary condition says the second derivative of x star is greater than equal to 0. So if x star is optimal, then it must satisfy these two conditions, okay? Let's do an example, see whether these conditions are satisfied or not. So I want to minimize x square over x in R, 
what's the first derivative so this is my f of x so gradient of f of x at x equal to 0 is 2x at x equal to 0 is equal to 0 and the second derivative of fx is actually equal to 2. So the first derivative is 0, the second derivative is positive, so it's certainly greater than or equal to 0. So 0, x equal to 0 or x star equal to 0 satisfies necessary conditions. Okay, both necessary conditions, the first order necessary condition and second order necessary condition. Yes. Yeah. So in general, are we going to assume f is twice differentiable? Yes. Okay. Most of the times we are, so throughout this course, we will always assume the function is as much, as many times differentiable as you want, at least twice differentiable. Okay. Uh, we are not going to talk about integer programming where x is a set of integers. So in that case, we cannot define differentiable. Yes. No. Oh, yes, that's a good point. So this is a matrix, right? It's a matrix, let's say M in our N cross N. And whenever I say that M is greater than or equal to zero, uh, it means in the language of optimization or in language of linear algebra, it means that M is positive semi-definite. Okay, so this is a short form of saying that something is positive semi-definite. And when I say that M is strictly greater than zero, it means M is positive definite. And for some reason, all these pens are not working anymore. Yes, there was a, another question, yes. No, that's the wrong, that's, th I'll get to that point in a bit, okay? Uh, there's a, so his point is that this is not how you find minimum. The way to find minimum is you take the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve the equation, you get x equal to zero, and so that's the minimum point. And there is a subtle mathematical uh, jump that you are making in that particular argument, okay? And I want to touch upon that particular point in this particular lecture. So let's consider another example, okay? I want to write x cube x in R, okay? Now we all know that there is no minimum or the infimum is equal to minus infinity. Right. Let's say someone says that x star equal to 0 is a local minimum for this particular function. So what's the first derivative of f of x is equal to 0 at x equal to 0. The second derivative is also 0 at x equal to 0. So what's going on? It turns out that this x, x star equal to zero satisfies both the first order necessary condition and second order necessary condition for this particular example. So what's going on? Sorry, what's the? But you know that x cube is not minimized at x equal to 0. x cube actually looks something like this. Okay, but that's not, that's not a justification for the rest of the class. It certainly is a correct mathematical justification. No, but there is something, there is something, there is a mathematical jump that we have made there 
what's the mathematical jump? So yes, it is correct that it's not it's necessary and not sufficient, but what's what does it mean for someone who doesn't know what the difference between necessary and sufficient condition means? Yes. Does it even mean a point of inflection? I, indeed it is a point of inflection, but but that's not but 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 you know so what you guys are saying is fact, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't satisfy someone <laughs> who doesn't know what you what you're talking about. Okay, uh, it requires a bit of mathematical training to say what you guys are saying. Okay, so let's look at this this statement carefully. If x star is a local minimum, then these conditions are satisfied. Okay, so x star has to be a local minimum for these conditions to be satisfied. In this case, x star was a local minimum, so the conditions are satisfied. In this case, the hypothesis actually doesn't hold true, so the conclusion doesn't make any sense. Right? So this is the hypothesis, this is the conclusion. Here, the hypothesis doesn't hold true, so x star is not a local minimum. Not a local minimum, so FONC and SONC does not mean anything okay it's an empty statement it's an empty statement because the con the hypothesis doesn't hold true right uh, if aliens will attack the planet then we all will be destroyed right but the hypothesis is just too <laughs> too outlandish right so so that's the problem here okay so necessary condition don't mean anything if your hypothesis is not satisfied. Now, coming back to your question, right? You raised the question that the way to find the local minimum is take the first derivative, set it equal to zero, find the points that satisfies it, and so on, right? So those are the points which may be a local minimum. You can apply that concept when you know that a local minimum exists. Okay, if you don't know, well in this case you know that a local minimum does not exist, so you cannot apply that procedure, right? But the knowing of existence of local minimum is the important part that you missed out in your statement, okay? So do conditions that are both necessary and sufficient exist? Yes. Or, or is it okay. We'll get to it in a few minutes. So when function f is convex, then this is also sufficient, okay? I mean, actually, if you don't even need this for, if f is convex, you don't even need this. This is sufficient. So how do, we, how do we prove that result? Let's go through a proof, very short proof. So I'm at point x. I move in the direction d. So I compute, so I know that x star is local minimum, which implies that fx star plus alpha d minus ffx star is greater than or equal to zero. That's by definition of local minimum. No matter which direction I move in. And okay, by the way, now I'm considering x to be in Rn. Okay, so I can pick any directions I want. All directions are feasible from a point x star. So I take a step alpha d away from x star and I subtract the function evaluated at x star. We know because x star is a local minimum, we know that this is greater than or equal to zero. So this means f of x star plus alpha d minus f of x star over alpha is greater than or equal to zero because alpha is a positive number, alpha in zero one. And then I'm going to take limit alpha goes to zero, f of x star plus alpha d minus f of x star over alpha. That has to be greater than or equal to zero because you're looking at a sequence, each point in the sequence is greater than or equal to zero, so the limit will also be greater than or equal to zero. And the limit exists because the function is differentiable. Now this is
this gives that the inner product between the gradient and direction d is greater than or equal to 0 and this holds for all d. No matter which direction d you choose, the inner product with the gradient has to be greater than or equal to 0. What does this imply? I have a vector, no matter, no ma so I have a vector, I take an inner product of that particular vector with any other vector in Rn and I get a non-negative number. What does that mean? Yes. So it's true for D. It's also true for negative D. When would this be true? Zero, right? So gradient of F at X star will be equal to zero. So that proves the first order necessary condition. Now I'm going to apply the sa same reasoning to second order necessary condition. So I have f of x star plus alpha d minus f of x star over alpha square. I take limit, alpha goes to 0. And I get half of d transpose gradient square f x star d and this is greater than or equal to 0. And this holds true for all possible d, this is for all d in Rn, which implies that the second derivative is positive semi-definite. So let me write it, is positive semi-definite. next topic is sufficient condition for optimality. Yes? With your statement of the limit at L f over alpha square, that at equals one half of the book d's, because yes, this is d. Yes, this is D. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is alpha. Okay. So here we use Taylor series expansion, okay? And we study Taylor series expansion in one of the previous classes. So let's look at sufficient condition. So if X bar satisfies first order sufficient condition, gradient f of x bar equal to 0. Second order sufficient condition, the second derivative of f x bar is strictly positive definite. So positive definite. Then x bar is strict local minimum. So strict word here is important. Okay, it's, it's a local minimum, but it's a strict local minimum.
okay let's look at an example i want to minimize x raised to 4 x in r i take the first derivative so 4x cube so at x equal to 0 this is equal to 0 the second derivative at x equal to 0 is also equal to 0 so what's going on It satisfies the first order necessary condition and second order necessary condition, but it doesn't seem to be satisfying the sufficient condition, right? So this is saying, hold on a second. So this is saying if x star satisfies these two conditions, then it's a strict local minimum. Now we know from experience that x equal to zero is a strict local minimum for this function because it looks as, I mean x, x star equal to zero is a local minimum. We know it by inspection, we know it by experience, right? So for some reason we are not able to use this result to prove that, to prove that x star equal to 0 is a strict local minimum for this function. So what's, uh, yeah? It's a sufficient condition, it's not a necessary condition. Right. So it can be a strict local minimum without meeting the sufficient Yes, okay. So, so what we have studied so far is, so let me reiterate his point. So his point is that it's a sufficient condition, right? So these two are sufficient conditions. You could have local minimum that don't satisfy sufficient condition, okay? And in the previous example we studied, uh, minimization of x cubed, we realized that there are points that satisfy necessary condition but it's not optimal, right? So. So what is the gist? Uh, necessary and sufficient conditions does not mean much. <laughs> okay. Well, that's not the that's not the case. Okay. In many situations, you will be able to uh, prove that the sufficient conditions are met, and therefore it's uh, local minimum. But uh, but in many cases like this, you may not be able to check for sufficiency sufficient conditions and therefore you would never be able to know whether that's a global min that's a local mini that's a strict local minimum or not okay any question so one thing one one picture that you should have in mind is the following picture which i haven't really seen in any book so i don't know why such a picture was never made. So this is your entire Rn. This is the set of points that satisfy necessary condition. And this is the set of points that are optimal. So by optimal, I mean it's a local minimum or a global minimum. And these are the points that satisfy sufficient conditions. Okay, and I want you guys to stare at this diagram for some time. Okay, and we have seen examples, x square, x cube, and x raised to 4, 
So there are points that satisfy necessary condition, but they are not optimal. There are points that are optimal, but does not satisfy sufficient conditions. There are points that satisfy sufficient conditions, and certainly they are optimal because of that particular result. Okay, does that make sense? The strongest one, yes. Yes, they are the strongest checks. So if you are solving a problem and you're able to show that sufficient condition holds, you should be extremely happy. Okay, extras, extras, okay, I, I cannot pronounce that word. Uh, yeah. So you're saying a point that satisfies sufficient condition but is not optimal? Uh, well, yes, so if you want to prove that the point, let's say you run an algorithm, okay, and I give you a function and I ask you to run certain algorithm and the algorithm gives some output. And I ask you to certify that that point is uh, an optimal point, right? How would you certify it? There's no way to certify it except for that sufficient condition on the board. That's the only certificate you will ever have to prove that a point is optimal, okay? Any other question? Yes? I think that was trying to get at the question of, we seem to have the word optimal applied that there is more than one best solution, right? This is it. So, but now it seems like we have some points that are optimal and some points that are really so yes, that's why there's local minimum and global minimum. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, I mean, consider this function. Okay. So, in this case, you have a global optimal and you have a local optimal. And some of the algorithms that we will study, if you start from this point, you will end up landing here. And Unfortunately, because of the nature of the function or whatever, you will never be able to know where the truly global optimal was, right? And you just have to be satisfied with this. Apply it in your system. If it works well, good. If it doesn't work well, you have to start all over again. Pick a random initial seed. Then next time you start a, the optimization from here, it again converges here, may not work well. You start the third point, you start from here, then it converges here. That's it, you are happy. With the question he was asking about the points that are optimal versus very optimal, it's the difference between the things that are optimal versus verifiably optimal. Well, because uh, we could use like constructive functions where there, uh, there would be a local min that we could determine, but the global uh, minimum would be something that uh, wouldn't pass a sufficient condition. It would pass yes. Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, one example for that would be, okay, so these are all global minimum, but none of them satisfy the sufficient condition, okay, because if you take the second derivative here, uh, it's all zero, okay, so it's something you have to live with, okay, the dirty facts of life, uh, okay, so in this example, you have two strict local minimum, and they will satisfy the second order sufficient conditions, but all the global minimums will never satisfy the second order sufficient conditions. They will satisfy the necessary conditions, but not sufficient conditions. Okay, so we just have to be content with that. Now the other stronger sufficient condition is uh, convex. So if f is convex, so assume that f is convex, then x star is global minimum if and only if gradient of f x star is equal to 0.
So I'm assuming that my function is convex. Then x star is a global minimum if and only if the first derivative is equal to zero. So in this situation, finding the first derivative and setting it equal to zero and solving that equation will actually give you the global minimum. Okay. And sometimes people say that necessary condition is also sufficient, okay? which they actually mean that first order necessary condition is actually sufficient. Okay? Because the second order necessary condition you don't need to, you don't need to check in this situation. So in this particular example, you cannot use this sufficient condition, but you can use this sufficient condition because you know that the function is convex. Okay. Yeah. So from an engineering perspective, uh, with uh, necessary conditions, do we wind up getting classes of problems um, where, where we say if it meets the necessary conditions, we're calling it good, and if we can't do it, it's uh, mathematically optimal? Yes. In fact, nowadays, these things are extremely famous. They are called deep learning methods. Okay? In fact, they don't even check. You, you know, once you train a deep neural network, you don't even check whether it satisfies the first order necessary condition or not. Right? You just call it good if it works well. And all the voice recognition software, Siri or whatever Google uses, it's all, or Alexa, what Alexa uses, it's all, there's no guarantee whatsoever that it's global minimum, local minimum, or whatever, right? It just seems to work, and it's in production now, right? Everyone uses it on a day-to-day -day basis. There was a high end somewhere in the back. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, but, but you have to be careful. So for instance, if you're doing, let's say, X-ray reconstruction, right? So some bone has broken in the body and you take like a 3D image or something and you want to reconstruct what exactly, what exactly has happened at that particular point. Uh, you need to be a little bit more careful uh, with these sufficient conditions and necessary conditions because let's say you come up with an example, with a software that seems to work well on 20, 100, or 500, or 1,000 case studies that you have. Uh, but if you cannot say much about what's happening, then the government will not allow that software to actually be used. So does it become a point where we can give up a restrict balance on whether it is in fact optimal? Sometimes you just have to change your function, f. Okay. So just change the function such that it looks good, it has some nice properties, and then it would work, hopefully. Okay, there's a lot of trial and error that goes on in this field. Okay. What's the time? Okay, now all these results can be proven along the same lines, uh, so I'm not going to prove it. Uh, but I want to give you an idea about what sufficient conditions and necessary conditions mean. Remember this figure, okay, because it's uh, very important. People get confused between necessary conditions and sufficient conditions, but they are extremely, they're very different, okay? You cannot use them interchangeably unless your function has some nice properties like convexity or something else. Okay. So the next topic is gradient descent methods. Uh, let me write it. Gradient descent methods. So the reason why I write methods because there is a whole bunch of methods that can be studied under the same umbrella of gradient descent method. Okay. So what's the problem? The problem is you give me a function, I come up with some initial starting point, and I want to develop an algorithm that will get me to a local minimum or a global minimum. Of course, I would want to get to a global minimum, 
but I'll be happy with local minimum. Okay, so the goal is find an algorithm that generates xk, a sequence xk k equals 1 to infinity, such that xk converges to x star. It could be a local or global. So what should the very, at the very least, what should be the property of such an algorithm? What is the desirable property of this algorithm? So let me write one desirable property. I want fxk plus 1 to be strictly less than f of xk. Okay. That's the desirable property of such an algorithm. This is the minimum we could hope for from this algorithm. Okay. So let me come up, let me tell you a very simple algorithm that would satisfy this desirable property. So I'm going to define my xk plus 1 as xk minus alpha gradient of f at xk. Okay. So let's look at what of what f of xk plus 1 is. It is f of xk minus Well, not minus. Let me write it in the Taylor series form. Plus gradient of f at xk transpose minus alpha gradient of fxk plus small o of alpha square. Or actually, it's small o of alpha because there are alpha square and alpha cube and so on. So I can write it as f of xk minus alpha norm of f of xk square plus o of alpha. So let's look at this uh, particular case for alpha very, very small, okay? So if xk was the optimal point, a local minimum, then we know that the gradient is going to be equal to 0, right? And xk plus 1 will be equal to xk and so on. So the se sequence is actually converged, right? So you don't have to run the algorithm anymore. Uh, if you reach the global minimum. On the other hand, if you haven't reached the global minimum or a local minimum, then you know that the gradient, uh, the gradient will be non-zero, right? Because you are somewhere in this, somewhere in this region, right, where the gradient is non-zero, okay? It's not equal to zero. It could be positive, negative, well, in the case of one dimensional function, it could be positive, negative, but in this case, all you need is that norm should be not equal to zero. So what you have is f of xk minus some positive number. Remember alpha is 0, 0,1. So you have some positive number and plus a very small term, okay? Now this is of the order of alpha, this is of the order of alpha square, right? So this term is going to dominate 
this term for alpha very very small okay so this is of the order of alpha square so you know that this for small alpha this is less than f of xk So let me show you by picture what exactly is happening here. So let's say this is ISO cost curve, so f of x equal to 3, f of x equal to 2, and this is x star. And here you are xk okay so you want to go from here all the way to this point x star right through this algorithm and you look at the gradient the gradient will be outward normal towards the increasing side of this curve so this is my gradient of fxk And so, so this is my xk minus uh, some delta gradient of fxk for delta going all the way from zero all the way to infinity, right? So if you pick alpha small enough, you might reach here, xk minus alpha gradient of fxk. So if you pick alpha very small or small enough, you will reach this point and you know that the function is smaller than at this point xk, right? But if you take a very large alpha, you might get out of this low cost curve and you will get probably the function value will become very large. So it's important that this alpha be small enough, okay? Yes? Is there a computational way to size various alpha uh, based on how far away you expect their uh, x star to be, or yes. is it something that has to be tuned? So we will, we will talk about how to pick alpha k in the next class okay so this class is over it's 245 now uh, so we will continue our discussion on gradient descent methods in the next class